This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending June 4th. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of CRE Finance. This week, new milestones with signs that we've turned the corner. U.S. COVID cases are the lowest in a year, and the U.K. had no deaths recorded Tuesday. And the Fed is winding down another relief effort, saying it will sell its corporate bond portfolio. In economic data, manufacturing picked up in May despite commodity and labor shortages. Weekly jobless claims dropped to a new low, and private payrolls surged. But all eyes are focused on the May jobs number that will be released tomorrow. Manus, economic indicators didn't adequately predict the April jobs number, which is a bit of an understatement. Are we in for another wild card tomorrow? Well, a couple of things have happened over the course of the last 30 days. Number one is it does feel like we've turned a corner. Everywhere you look from the Indianapolis 500 to Nick games to restaurants in New York City, you know, things look like they're full again, or at least 80% full. So it does feel like things are coming back to normal. Uh, I think that that should be reflected better this month than it was last month. The other thing that we know that took place over the last month or so is I think we were up to more than 20 states that curtailed their federal additional unemployment insurance. So it makes it less incentived, if that's the word, there's less of an incentive for workers to stay home because they're not making as much in at least 20 of the 50 states. So I think that if there is a miss coming tomorrow, I think it won't be nearly as eye-opening as it was last month. The ADP report, as you said today, almost a million jobs in the private sector, a lot of offices starting to reopen. So I, I think that if there is a miss, as I said before, uh, it won't be the shock that it was. I, I think the big headline for this week, in addition to that million dollar jobs number, was more inflationary pressure coming through, right? All the indicators were modestly hotter than people were predicting. Employers are still having a tough time getting people to come to work in certain markets. They're having to pay up to get people to come back. And I do think that that's going to impact prices uh, down the road. I think that the most shocking chart out there, other than AMC's stock price movements over the last couple of days, uh, which by the way is hilarious that the stock goes up 100% and the next day they announce that they're selling shares. I think that's just incredible. This chart out there that's shocking is the number of people on unemployment and the number of job openings. I don't remember what the num what the numbers were, but it's like 10 to one. For every person on unemployment, there's like more than five jobs open at this point. So you said it, Manus, the biggest thing right now is how do you attract workers back? And you have to, first of all, you can't incentivize people not to work. And second of all, you're going to have to raise wages and that's going to put inflation pressures on, on the wage side, just like we've seen it everywhere else. The little nugget I had this week, the little anecdote that I had that was indicative of what employers are facing right now is I live in a little condo in Westchester and we have a pool in the backyard and they could not find an individual to sit by this pool so that we could swim, right? You have to have a lifeguard there. The whole pool is, I don't know, 20 feet by 15 feet. It's barely bigger than a backyard thing and it doesn't get deeper than four and a half feet. It's the easiest lifeguarding job in the world. And yet, and I think they probably pay pretty well. And most of the time there's nobody there. So you can bring a book or whatever. And we can't find a college kid to come there and, and staff this thing. So uh, that was my little anecdote of the week that, you know, if we can't find somebody to do a really simple job for 15 or 20 bucks an hour, you know, how are you going to get them to fill a job at something that's a little harder? You know what? I have a, I have a different spin on that and maybe I'm, I'm probably totally wrong, but I feel like the teenage job thing is a thing of the past. And now it seems like younger and younger and younger, at least in places like you're talking about, kids are looking for either they're not working or they're playing travel sports or they're looking for a fancy dancy internship, even at 16 or 17 years old. So I'll take the optimistic view and say that they're looking for better jobs. 
But then again, when I was that age, like I was, I, I was dying to be a lifeguard, but I was playing sports in the summer. So who knows? The TREP CMBS delinquency rate dropped for the 11th straight month to 6.16%, another big drop. What are the details behind the headline? Well, I think the, the big details are consistent with how we opened the show, which is we, we seem to have turned a corner. The delinquency rate dropped by another 35 basis points, give or take. It's down to under 6.2% which is down from 10.32% at its peak in June, 2020. So we're down more than four percentage points. We're down about 40% from that peak in less than a year or in about a year, I should say it's an even 12 months since that has taken place. But some of the, the other numbers are even more startling to the positive side. Retail peaked at 18% in June, 2020 down under 11% now, lodging even better, 24% in June of 2020, down to 14% now, a little over 14% in as of the end of May 2021. So just really remarkable improvements in this. And to that lodging number, I would add this little parenthetical, and that is that back in, let's say, October, November, of 2020, when we were talking about delinquency numbers in hotels of 19 and 20 percent, there was that parenthetical, which was it's 19 percent, but it really might be 22 percent because there's all these forbearances out there that the borrower is tapping their FF and E reserves to keep these things current. There's probably a shadow delinquency. At this point, you have to believe that most of the shadow delinquency has been squeezed out of the market that that 14% delinquency rate that you're seeing now is a true number. There's not a lot out there of relief left. There's some, but not a, not a ton. And it wouldn't be shocking to see this 14% be headed to 10% by July 4th, you know, or maybe, you know, the end of the summer. We are really coming back strong and, and it's impressive to see. Um, some other numbers we're seeing at this point Special servicing continues to come down. There we went under 9% this month. We'll have a report on that later in the, in, in the week. So that peaked at about 10.5%. Now we're at about 8.6%. More positive numbers there. The real beneath the covers number this month is that a lot of loans that were 30 days delinquent last month went back to current. So a lot of guys that were kind of cuspy right, that have been hanging out in that 30-day delinquency category cured this month. So just good news everywhere in this report. And you can look at our blog for more details. Another positive podcast episode, Manus. How dare we? <laughs> this is just wrong. Uh, we do need to go back to whenever that was last year when we made our predictions. It was about around this time last year, I think, right? Because we were at the peak and we, we made predictions on where we would be a year from then. I think I was extremely bullish and you were, I would call you moderate. Someone got a, someone like who's a real loyal listener will I'm sure ping us via email and tell us where we're at. But the one thing that I would mention on the lodging, I mean, we're kind of back to, you have, you can't paint it with a broad brush now anymore, right? We were painting it with a broad brush for like a year and now it's destinations, vacation spots, you know, those types of places are pumping and conference centers, you know, hotels with huge conference halls and things like that. I think those are the ones that you have to kind of just keep earmarked. I mean, I think that business travel and business spending will come back, but it's going to take a long time. It's kind of like how office comes back is similar to the story about how travel comes back, right? Because if no one's in their office, no one's traveling to see them and uh, also conferences. So but there's so many entrenched business models that rely on these things. So big giant event companies and, and large conferences in our industry and every other industry that's, you know, it's part of the fabric of these industries. So they, they have to come back. I just don't know exactly when we might be another year out from the really huge conferences. If I were going to kind of handicap this market and, and talk about those things that I would, I would expect to lag it would be the four we've been talking about for a long time, Houston, New York, Chicago, and Portland. And 
each of those has something else in addition to COVID that will hold it back, in my opinion. In the case of Houston, there was too much supply and they had the energy woes for a long time, which was weighing on the entire economy down there. And, and that will be slower to rebound. In New York, you have the, the headline risk, which has been that New York has been quote unquote crime ridden, right? Quality of life issues and so forth. And for those people that see that on CNN or Fox or wherever they get their news from, you're not coming back to see Broadway shows in the fall if you're concerned about that. And you'd make that same claim about Portland where there's been civil unrest. Uh, New York also had a glut of hotels before the pandemic. And then in Chicago, it, it's, it's again, it's a supply issue, too much supply going into the pandemic. So, you know, for those that are looking to kind of handicap this market, we do expect, or I do expect a lot of the, these markets to come back really strongly. Those would be four markets, I think, that would underperform kind of the benchmarks. I think in New York is just so heavily commuter based that a lot of the employment in New York City is kind of support employment for the office worker, right? Or for the tourist, right? So if you can't get the office workers and the tourists back into the city, then it has the double effect of it doesn't only hurt the businesses that directly serve them, but it also hurts the restaurants, the dry cleaners, the Uber drivers, the cab drivers, the whole thing, right? So that's why I think Martha was going to mention later that the unemployment rate in New York City is, is I think, double what it is uh, across the country. Well, while we're on the, the New York subject matter, you know, one of the things that I'll be watching closely in New York is, is there a big differentiation on the office side between lower Manhattan, where you really can't get to without getting on a subway, versus midtown Manhattan, right? You can get to most of midtown by walking from a commuter train, right? From either Penn Station or the Port Authority or Grand Central Terminal. If you have to get on a subway and go downtown, given the quality of life issues, given the health issues and so forth, we may find over time that that is a slower market to recover. Only time will tell, but it may be the kind of thing where you find workers saying, you know, I'm very happy to come into Midtown because I'm on a commuter railroad, it's less, densely populated, I have my own seat and so forth versus having to do that and then get on the seven train or the, the four train and get down to wall street. I mean, we're, we're totally biased to our own experiences, which is taking the train to the city. I think if you went downtown on a Saturday night right now, I think it's pretty popping, but that's, that's for the people who live down there and who are out partying. It's, you still need those million people who commute to the city every day to start commuting back to the city to really support the ecosystem. The last time I was popping, the first George Bush was president. So <laughs> I haven't been popping in a long time. I don't know. Oh. I'm, I'm still thinking about that when we mentioned your dance moves a couple oh, podcasts ago. I think I saw a video of that. <laughs> so turning to office, some experts this week have said that Americans are done with the five-day in-office work week and that hybrid's here to stay. Yeah, I mean, there was another headline out there. I don't remember where I saw it, where it was some number, and I'm just going to pick this out of the air. I don't remember precisely what it was. Let's say it was 30% of workers said that they would consider changing jobs to go from a place that was five days a week to something that was hybrid. And that may be real. Only time will tell. And that may be the kind of thing that influences offices and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, I think you may see big differentiation between those types of employers that really have to fight to attract talent versus those that are kind of older businesses with kind of more replaceable workforces and, and, and so forth. So just like with lower Manhattan, I think there's a lot of stories yet to be written on the office space. And I, I don't think anybody knows at this point. We did see a lot of positive and, and some negative stories this week. Let's start with uh, some of the positive stories. I'm not sure if I mentioned this on the podcast or in a, an industry session recently, but I did mention a, an area of concern for me was Charlotte recently, just because of the number of cranes in that area and the number of projects going up there. I think there's like 22 different projects going on in that city right now and an awful lot of space coming online. But the first story uh, came from the Insurance Journal, which noted that USAA is going to open up an office in Charlotte and add, I think, 500, 500 or 600 workers 
in that city. So that was a, a really positive sign there. Uh, KBS signed a long-term lease renewal for almost 190,000 square feet it, at the Dulles Station East in Herndon, Virginia. That was uh, via press release. We, we saw that. Uh, the Meridian Group landed the ABA, the American Bankers Association, for 87,000 square feet of space at 13033 New Hampshire Avenue in Washington, D.C., and in lower Manhattan, after, you know, 30 seconds after I questioned its vibrancy in the office space, I will point out that GFP Real Estate added the Legal Aid Society on a 30-year lease for almost 200,000 square feet at 40 Worth Street in lower Manhattan. That organization will be consolidating from three lower Manhattan offices, so you know, some really nice green shoots there in upstate New York in Latham, which is a suburb of Albany. Uh, the New York State Insurance Fund uh, added almost 200,000 square feet in that area. So uh, a lot of activity there. And to me, that's a sign of confidence, right? People thinking that, you know, we need this space. People are coming back. You don't take this space unless you have plans for it, right? It's a lot of money. I once went to a wedding in Latham, New York. I think I lost a day. <laughs> so in terms of a couple of the other things that Martha mentioned, the stay at home or the hybrid model is here to stay. Apple just today, Wall Street Journal was reporting that uh, Tim Cook had come out and said they're going to a 3-2 model, three in, two out, starting in September. I found it interesting that they're gonna do Monday, Tuesday, Thursday in the office. Um, it's kind of random, I don't know why. Uh, it just seemed kind of weird. And then Martha also had brought up this Stanford economist who said that Americans are done with the five-day work week, work week, and that's going to cause a donut effect, which I guess means that the suburbs around the big cities are going to do okay, because that's where all the workers were anyway, or most of the, a lot of the workers, and they're just going to stay there, or the people in the city are moving out, which we've been seeing for a long time. I've had a much different donut effect during COVID. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. Every time we talk about this stuff, I just have to remind ourselves and also the listeners that we are human beings who need to be around other people. And we are also human beings who suffer from all sorts of recency bias. We could very well be here a year from now in the office, face to face, four or five days a week, you know, saying, can you believe we thought we were never coming back? So I'll give a couple of uh, other positive stories on the office market before we move to a little crabgrass. A couple of uh, sales. This one came from Globe Street, a joint venture of CB Group and, and Farallon purchased three offices, totaling more than a million square feet uh, in Atlanta. Good story there. And uh, Divco West, this is more lower Manhattan. This is kind of like lower West Side, uh, Soho area. Paid $135 million for 325 Hudson Street down there in kind of that Varick Street neighborhood. Used to be good for the city winery down there, which uh, which was a great little venue for seeing live music at a place for with under 300 people. A terrific venue, which was forced out because Disney put a big office there. So another sign there. Crabgrass, let's talk about a couple of things there. This is a little bit of maybe an educational segment in addition to a little bit of crabgrass. SunTrust is going to vacate its space in Richmond, Virginia. It's a Richmond suburb, actually. Um, you know, may, you may recall that SunTrust and BB&T merged a couple of years ago to form Truist. Uh, we noted that management, you know, a couple of years ago had chosen Charlotte for its combined headquarters that would wipe out some space in Winston-Salem and Atlanta. And now it appears at West Broad Street in Richmond. Uh, this is a story from the Richmond Business Sense. Um, SunTrust will be vacating more than 250,000 square feet at that property. They're the sole tenant at one of the buildings with 215,000 square feet, and they are a, a partial tenant at another building right next door. Uh, those two properties back a $41 million CMBS loan. It makes up 4% of a 2018 deal, a CMBX 12 deal. So in, to in all total, uh, SunTrust has about 60% of the space at these two properties. 
but you know the educational segment here is for those people that are trading bonds or have or portfolio managers a lot of times these stories are told years before they actually happen so in our own research in our daily trip wire we will put out stories all the time which say SunTrust and BB&T are merging here are 10 offices where SunTrust and BB&T are major tenants with near term lease expirations and a lot of times these things do turn into empty space over time. And, you know, for the savvy portfolio manager or trader, it's something to keep an eye on and keep footnotes of and, and so forth, because it does uh, at times become problems down the road. By the way, just before I get to the other pieces of crabgrass, Trep Wire this week became 12. Our 12th anniversary was today. And by our estimate, We've written somewhere between 10,000 and 12,000 credit stories. We publish every business morning, never having missed a morning, since June 3rd, 2009. So it was conceived out of the great financial crisis when there was so much happening that we wanted to inform our, our clients of uh, TRIP, CMBS and TRIP loan of credit moving events. And now we are year 12. And what does that mean, Martha? What is, what is the gift when you have your 12 year anniversary? What, what, what should we give to the writers of, is it like tin or something? Traditionally it's linen. Oh, so, well, well, well. I don't know <laughs> what one would do with linen. Manis, I'll send you some very nice tablecloths in the mail. <laughs> well, Napkin. I'm thinking bigger. I'm thinking, can we have a trip wire slash trip podcast toga party where we take <laughs> over a you know what i don't know like can we take over a small venue like the city winery can we get colin hay to come in and, and strum some tunes for <laughs> two, <laughs> two or three hours and and wear you know all wear you know toga outfits oh my my it's a beautiful world that song yeah um, i love colin hay yeah he's a good one tripwire toga love well it. here's the thing once you start something you got to just keep doing it right that's it and that's why Amen. We are, I don't know how many episodes we've done, but we, we are a year and three months into this or a year and two months and we have not missed a week. So it's one of those things that the longer you do it, the, the harder it is to not do it. Well, you know, when they say at these conferences, they, you know, the attire is creative, corporate, casual, you know, if we do have this toga party, I would like it to be tasteful corporate toga. You know, tasteful please. toga. Please, no, you know, no misbehavior. This is a rated G, you know, operation here. Maybe PG. So we are also publishing an office report that our own analyst, Catherine Liu, put together. And there are some details that she put into this report that have to do with average occupancy numbers. Yeah, so Catherine is uh, a killer. She's always putting uh, stuff together like this. And I remember when she first started, when she was just a little pup out of college and now she's like a killer research analyst associate i should say so there's a bunch of stuff in this report but a couple of the highlights you'll have to download the report to get everything uh, some of the larger markets in terms of average occupancies in cmbs office buildings i don't see one market where you have increases in occupancies new york down from 93 and a half to 91 percent dc down from 91 to around 90 you know, Houston, 85 to 83 and so on and so on. So it's a good, this is from March of 2022, April of this year. And then some of the harder hit markets in terms of what percentage of loans have uh, less than 80% occupancy, Kansas city, almost 30% DC, uh, almost 30% Bridgeport, Chicago, Houston, Miami, Detroit, Dallas, San Diego, Atlanta. That's kind of the the large MSAs with large swaths of open office space in CMBS offices. There's a bunch of other stuff in this report. And one, something that I want to look at that maybe we'll report back to you next week is, you know, following up on a, a point or two that was made by us, by Ryan Severino at JLL and by others that the next couple of years are going to be tough sledding for offices. Actually, Donut Shorts was DMing me about this the other day and, you know, while we don't think that work from home is a forever thing and that we don't think that the office is dead, the next year and a half or two, especially 
older office buildings, class B office buildings, buildings that have not had, you know, their HVAC systems renovated or they don't have the cool, um, they look more like Gordon Gecko than Mark Zuckerberg offices. You know what I mean? I think those are the ones that are, that are gonna really have some struggles. And again, they may not go, you know, super low occupancy, but they're just not gonna be able to garner the rents that they probably could have uh, had COVID not happened. So something I wanna look at in CMBS data anyway is kind of a breakdown of all of the square footage that's expiring over the next year and a half and where that there are large swaths expiring in older buildings that haven't been renovated. You know, that's if I was kind of a CMBS analyst, those are the ones I'd really be kind of earmarking, just like Mattis was mentioning before on, on the tripwire stuff. Yeah, I, I think that there are things that we will not see and understand for a year from now. And some of them we touched upon, you know, I talked about the lower Manhattan effect. Will people be less willing to get on a subway than they will be to get in Midtown? You know, will people be more, especially younger people, programmers, algorithm writers for big tech firms, will they be more willing to go to an Apple because they're that three, two, than perhaps a Facebook or Google if they go five days full? And will Facebook and Google have to match that Apple 3-2? And what impact will that? And how about firms that, you know, the average worker age, let's say, you know, maybe older accounting firms or law firms might be 45 and up, right? They're not as tech savvy, right? It, so all of these things we can speculate on, we can speculate on them all day. We don't really know, right? It's going to take a year or so to figure out, and, and not to mention the migration effect, Right, we saw this week that Chewy was talking about moving their corporate offices from Massachusetts down to Florida. Right, I think somewhere in the Boca Raton area, that was another the headline. Right, how much of that comes into play now? Um, you know, over the next you know couple of years, as leases expire and people say, you know, we've learned that we don't have to be in this high-priced Manhattan Bay Area, you know, Chicago you know, those types of markets to get things done. I'd really like to see the different, everybody's Argus runs on these office buildings now compared to before, you know, how, how have the lease up assumptions changed? What was the, what's the percentage in terms of renewal that everybody's running? And I don't mean like the optimistic ones, but like the real ones, you know, what, what, what are some of these assumptions? And that's where we can't tell you what's going to happen, but we can tell you like maybe the cap rate or the NOI on that, that office building that you're kind of modeling in your CMBS runs. Those are the ones you, you know, you turn up the dial a little bit on those ones. Turning to hotels. What are the stories we've, we've got for Tripwire this week? So this is a nice smooth segue from Joe's point about the Argus models and assumptions and so forth, what are cap rates and renewal rates and rent per square foot that goes into the office space. We got a very interesting sale this week that was quite revealing in the hotel market. You know, I, I think it underscores just how strong this recovery might be six months from now. So the story comes from Hospitality Net. Uh, you could find it there, but I'll summarize it. And it's not really a story. It's a press release. So Bramer Hotel and Resorts, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, has acquired Mr. C Hotel, Beverly Hills, which is actually technically in Los Angeles, but it's the Mr. C Beverly Hills Hotel. It's a 138-room luxury hotel. They acquired it for $65.4 million. It was part of a two property acquisition in total, they, they spent 77 million. The other 12 million was for a five key condominium, which is attached to the hotel. But here are some benchmarks for people to kind of chew on, which I found shocking in their tightness, if you will, or lowness uh, in terms of what the borrower paid in terms of cap rates and so forth. So. Bramer paid $474,000 per key for the luxury hotel. It represented a 12 month cap rate of 5% on the 2019 net operating income 
the company hopes to realize a stabilized yield of 8% on the investment over the next three to five years. RevPAR heading into the pandemic was about 250 bucks per room with 75% occupancy and an average daily rate of 334. Uh, again, you can see all of this uh, on the on the web, but you know there haven't been a lot of comps, and there have been very few examples of this kind of transparency for a transaction. And for me, for a market that has been so buried and is just now recovering, and for which people are always kind of trying to pull the proverbial rug out from under you, you know, there's always this kind of variant you have to worry about. We got to worry about you know, next fall and next winter and so forth. And they may need a booster shot with, you know, the vaccine, you know, all those may be true, you know, which may undercut the recovery, but a 5% cap rate on 2019 numbers and an 8% total return, you know, you know, annual return over three to five years. To me, that's a shockingly strong number and a real sign that people believe that the hotel market is back. <laughs> By the way, I'll throw in the fact that that particular asset, both assets, the hotel itself and the five room, five key condominium next door backs a $50 million CRE CLO loan, which should now get paid off. That loan was slated to mature in July and that will get paid off. You can read about that in Trepwire over the next day or two. So Manis, given what you said, the lowness of these cap rates, I mean, are these people not thinking that interest rates will increase in, in the future? Or I guess maybe they're thinking that they can raise rates with inflation, right? Like raise, you know, average daily room rates. Perhaps, or maybe they think this is going to be such an explosive level that they're thinking cap rates are on their way to four. Yeah. Right. And, you know, it's not out of the question, right? We, we've seen really tight cap rates over the years. We've seen incredible chasing of yields. And it's, it's not out of the question that that's where we're going. Um, if this economic recovery is as powerful as some are thinking it may be, right? And I do think it's a hedge, right? I think that you can pass through these costs. If, if wages go up and salaries go up and disposable income remains high, right? I think you're going to see um, the ability to pass through these numbers. I mean, this particular area, it really serves like Rodeo Drive and that creative area of Los Angeles, which, you know, I guess they're really expecting a nice bounce. So, I mean, I'm loving the number. I'm loving the comps because it does say to me that there is confidence in this previously just decimated industry. A couple of other headlines I have this week, which were uh, nice that I think we wrote about both of these in Trepwire this week. Um, both talked about hotels that it looks like full payoffs are coming. Uh, the first one was a $15 million Courtyard Marriott Shadyside loan. The workout code had been foreclosure recently. Uh, it backs a 2017 CMBX 11 loan. This month, the code was reset to full payoff. The collateral is a 132 key limited service hotel in a Pittsburgh MSA built in 03, renovated in 2014. The interesting thing here was that the hotel was valued at 27 million in 2017. It was lowered last year to under 14 million. So there was negative equity in the hotel, a little bit of negative equity uh, in the hotel, but now the special servicer is flagging this thing is likely a full payoff. A similar story with the uh, Holiday in Hammond, in Hammond, Louisiana. Uh, here you have a $7 million loan, which again, it looked like uh, at one point this was going to go the foreclosure route. And now the special servicer is indicating that a full payoff is likely. So between the falling delinquency rate, the Bramer uh, story, and, and some of these stories, you know, just a lot of, a lot of green shoots, far more green shoots than crabgrass this week. So it's interesting that uh, both of these stories have that concept of lockout 
and waiving potentially waiving prepayment penalties and things like that. And then also on this this Hammond one, uh, you have here that the the special servicer is indicating that full recourse has been triggered because additional debt was taken on by the borrower. So that could be part of the reason that the borrower is planning to pay this off because now there's recourse to him and not just the property. But I wonder how, how many of these we'll see before you start to see a, at least a little bit of pushback from some of the, the investors who are losing out on a lot of interest payments here. Well, I think it remains to be seen. You ask a question, which is, will they forego a defeasance penalty or some kind of lockout charge or yield maintenance? And, and we have seen that in the past, right? These payoffs have come at the expense of uh, the interest, the IO holder and the first the pay top guy. Tranche, right? Yeah, exactly. But if these things are valued at such a level where there's still equity in there, right? You could see the special servicer say, no, we want some accommodation. We want this thing defeased. It's not enough for you to pay this off. But we watch these things closely. We look at the data all the time. And, you know, we're always looking for stories that tell this story. And as we as we come across them, we try to point them out to you. So Yeah, and the Hammond one was a 2013 deal. So the defeasance, if it is in defeasance right now, which I'm not sure, it wouldn't be as much as if it as this other one, which is a 2017 deal, which has a lot more room to run. Right. But it is a, a source of concern. And if I'm an IO holder, you know, you're always trying to price these things to worst. I'm pricing this saying this thing is going to pay off in two or three months. Have we ever done an educational segment on defeasance? I don't think we should do it now because I don't want everyone to fall asleep. Not. But maybe maybe next week we got to do a defeasance because that's one of those things that it's a word that you mention sometimes without realizing that only like weirdos in this industry know what it means. That's right. Watch it. Watch it. What? Watch it. Don't you call our clients weirdos. <laughs> weirdos and non-weirdos. Weirdos. You know, we, we all have... Uh, Equal opportunity weirdos. That's right. <laughs> Turning to multifamily, we have an update on multifamily analysis that we originally did in April. So let's dig into that. So we wanted to do a follow-up on this. We put this out in April. What we tried to do was look at all the markets in the U.S. and see which markets had properties where occupancy was tilting lower and which ones were you know, not and which ones were holding their own. People can look back to that. It was late April. If you don't see it on our blog listing, let us know, and we're happy to share it with you. It kind of segmented the market between winners and losers, and we noted some big areas like Orlando and Phoenix and Omaha and I think Tucson where none of the properties backing any private label CMBS loans or Freddie Mac loans had occupancy of less than 80% based on either full year or partial year 2020 occupancy numbers. And then we pointed out that some markets had significant numbers. New York was one of them. Uh, Boston was another. Uh, and there were, there were several that were uh, above 10% in that category. So we wanted to go back and look at this again with a different lens. And we started isolating, you know, the biggest properties out there that had seen occupancy fall below 80% and really stay below 80%. And what we're seeing is that this is a tale of really just a couple of markets at this point. One is New York. In fact, I think it was something like eight out of 10 or nine out of 11 of the single property loans, right? Loans backed by one asset. Nine of the 11 biggest ones were in New York. And that was either Manhattan, Brooklyn, or Long Island City, Long Island City really peppered the list, and there were two in San Francisco. So those two markets, you saw real increase levels of vacancy there. Everywhere else, you know, no major market kind of lights up your screen. You have drips and drabs in Washington, D.C., Raleigh, um, I think Chicago, you know, but they were onesie twosies, but in that New York market and San Francisco, you saw some big loans with 75s, 70s. Let me give you the other side of the coin, however, which we write about in this piece, and this piece is coming out early next week. We looked at 180 Water Street, which is 
in the financial district of Manhattan, so lower Manhattan, Wall Street area. This is a 580 unit complex. You can walk to, you know, the Goldman Sachs offices and, and so forth in, in lower Manhattan. Um, it's debt structure on the loan. It's a $265 million loan, $137 million senior note, $127 million B note. Uh, the B note is securitized. The property was built in the early seventies, renovated about five years ago, four years ago, something like that. So the interesting thing is that it ended last year with an occupancy of 63%. It, it went as low as 59% in December, early December of 2020, 63% at year end. And so it showed up on a list for that reason. It had dropped from about 95% to 63%. But when we looked at watch list notes for this, and hopefully this is a harbinger of what's to come for all these other properties, it gives quite granular detail on what's happened since then. It notes that occupancy ticked up to 70% in March of 2021 and 80% by mid-April 2021. So um, in addition to other parts of the economy, we're starting to see here, and this is one property, one anecdote, evidence of a property kind of rebounding with its occupancy, right? going from 59% to 80% over the course of three months. So another terrific anecdotal data piece for people to chew on. Yeah, I would say just looking at the list of the, you know, the large properties with less than 80% occupancy, you know, those are all relatively new, large, luxury, high rent type apartment buildings. And those were the ones that were hit quickly and the hardest, right? So. Uh, but they'll also, I think, be the ones that can lease up very quickly as things recover because they are so nice and they, uh, they'll they be able to attract the young people who are the ones that are living in the city or moving back to the city the first. first. And they found somewhat of an equilibrium, I think, in terms of, you know, lowering rents and giving out some concessions uh, to kind of increase uh, absorption. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I would just... Make sure that we say with the with all these reports on multifamily, and we've said it before, is that at no time was the multifamily market looking like hotel or retail. In the multifamily, we were talking about certain markets fraying, unlike the unraveling that we saw in hotel and retail six months ago, a year ago, right? This is just, you know, keeping an eye on certain things that are marginally weaker than other parts of the market. We're not expecting wholesale defaults on properties in Long Island City or San Francisco. You know, we're not we're not there for those that were at their keyboard getting ready to chastise me for being gloom and doom. No, remember, we're back. <laughs> and we saw a story this eviction moratorium takes yet another turn. The uh, judges in the U.S. Court of Appeals ruled that the eviction moratorium will stay in place after, if you remember the last time we talked about it, a judge had ruled that the agency had o overstepped its bounds in authority. I mean, what can we say anymore about this? It's madness. Back and forth. Back and it's forth. madness, right? I mean, I'm not sure who's right or who's wrong, but like at some point or another, there are job openings, Right. People are coming back to work. Things are getting better. GDP growth is off the charts. Like, at some point, we have to allow people to collect rent. In, th in theory, speaking of, <laughs> in theory, speaking of, in theory, or else only suckers pay rent. Remember? Well, you know, uh, the New York online pandemic relief rental assistance program went live Tuesday, and. Officials had allocated $2.7 billion for the program statewide, but the Real Deal reported that there were some hiccups with the system. Applicants were having trouble, errors. They couldn't upload documents. So as much as this was a long-awaited program, it seems they might have to wait just a tad bit longer to get that rent paid. It would be ironic for the you know one of these landlords to cyber attack that site hold the site hostage for ransom, like they did that meatpacking industry <laughs> that and use that be. to restore the rent that they're not getting. 
right? Not that I'm planting any ideas in any like uh, evil genius's head out there. Well, as someone who is a product person at a software and data company, I feel for these people who put together this, whatever this website was, and then just got overwhelmed by demand. So, but at the same time, you know, it's just, it's classic, right? It's classic. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so deal of the week. So the deal of the week, I'll go back to um, one of the ones I referred to as the green shoot in, in the office market. This is the GFP nabbing the Legal Aid Society for a 30-year, 200,000-square-foot lease at 40 Worth Street. Uh, it's our deal of the week for several reasons. One, the length of the lease, 30 years. You don't really see that very often, right? Most leases are, are 10 years with some renewal options. The size of the lease, 200,000 200, square feet. The market that it's in, in New York City, financial district, uh, all of those were terrific. Let me give um, some credit where credit is due. Hopefully I pronounce these uh, correctly, but uh, there's a good chance I won't. Craig Riker, Christopher Mansfield, Greg Maurer, Hollander, and Peter Gamber. They represented the tenant, the Legal Aid Society. Those people are from CBRE. Brian Steinwurzel and Roy Lapidus of GFP uh, represented the owner. Uh, that was 40 Worth Street Associates LLC, um, which sounds like a shell group. I'm not sure who owns the building in earnest. Uh, the space was previously occupied by Charity Water and Public Health Solutions. This story comes from Real Estate Weekly. So kudos to all those people that took part in that and uh, gave a bolster to the New York City, Lower Manhattan real estate market. Take that, Manus. You were so down on Lower Manhattan, and then, then you're saying that there's this great story. So listen. Turning to shout outs, Don Sheets from Broadshore released his June Sheets Sheets, not easy to say, <laughs> with CRE analysis that referenced Trep and his most recent podcast appearance. So thank you, Don, for giving us a shout out. And if you aren't a subscriber to Sheet Sheets, send us a note and we'll let you know how to do that. It's a pretty informative document. And TREP announced the winners of its future commercial real estate awards programs for undergrads. And those folks are now going to be world famous, at least to our podcast list listeners. Danielle DeVito from University of Michigan, Alexander Act from Indiana University, Connor Land from Texas A&M, John Micas from Middlebury, Grace Miller from UVA, Sam Pittman from Indiana, Tyler Tricon from University of Wisconsin, and Andrew Williams from UVA. Smart bunch of kids. Congratulations and good luck. Now, thousands upon thousands of people have heard their names, but knowing kids these days, I'm sure some of these people have more followers on Instagram than we have podcast listeners, or which TikTok. is just, or TikTok. Or well, I don't know what else there is. Anymore. If they do get invites to the, uh, you know, the toga party, let's make sure that they're 21 and over because this will, you know, probably have an open bar and, and so forth. I left out a, a real shout out last week, which uh, I'm going to get to uh, belatedly. You know, I never like missing out on giving shout outs to those that serve this country. You know, last week was Memorial Day. We had taped the Thursday before Memorial Day. So this is a, and I do know that there's listeners uh, among my friend groups that are in the industry that served this country at one time or another. So to all those people that, you know, served this country over the years and, and served for our freedom, you know, a big shout out to, to all you guys and gals. Amen. We salute you. So you guys, I don't know if you know this, but visits to Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, and I guess they just call it Dunkin' now, right? Uh, and Panera are rising according to Placer AI. Remember, we had Placer AI on a pod several months ago. And that sounds kind of boring, but it may mean that life is getting back to some normal routines. It's the donut effect. Different. I, I would like to see the uh, breakdown of those numbers uh, in terms of 
Dunkin's and Starbucks that have a drive through versus don't. I'd love to see how many people are going to the Dunkin's and Starbucks's Starbucks, Star, Starba, Starbucks's <laughs> that don't have a drive through, right? Because I can tell you for sure that my experience has been that the drive throughs are just off the charts this, during this whole COVID time. So, but anyway, it's very good to see because you know me, I'm a, I'm a very big fan uh, of Dunkin' Donuts. With that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keen. Join us next week as we review what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or a comment, send an email to podcast at trep.com. For more information, visit trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>